Hi, uh, so my name is Sarah. I am part of the group that is doing chapters three and four, and my basic focus is going to be on Phelan syndrome. So, um, basically what Phelan syndrome is, is a rare and debilitating condition um, that involves the visual perception. So, um, basically it occurs when there's bilateral damage to the parietal lobes. Um, what's interesting about this specific syndrome um, is that it is extremely complex. It has three parts that go along together um, that make this condition extremely difficult for um, the person that is dealing with it um, to function in the world. And so what I'm going to do is explain to you each of these three subcategories that makes Balance Syndrome um, what it is. So we're going to go step by step. <laughs> so the first one um, that is categorized under Balance Syndrome is called simultagnosia. So simultagnosia is basically the idea that one cannot see a complex scene. So your vision is very focused. Um, other people also call it object blindness um, because you aren't seeing all of the objects in the room. Normally you can only focus on one and a lot of that happens because um, items overlap. So basically when someone walks into a room um, they will be able to grasp on visually to one thing, but it might not be the thing that they desire to look into. So here's an example. So let's say you have a phone and a pencil. And let's say that you put one of these things in front of the other. Now, someone with simultagnosia might say, yeah, I can see the pencil. Cool. I can see the phone. Awesome. But when you overlap them, they may or may not be able to see the phone or the pencil. It depends on everybody's different perspective. So you could say, hey, I have this phone here and this pencil. That's great. What do you see? And they'll say, oh, I see the phone. Or, oh, I see the pencil. Or maybe they won't even see those. Maybe they'll see me holding it up. But you want to try to focus their attention here. You can also overlap it this way, or sideways, and you're not sure what they'll see because they're not able to see both at one time. This makes it very difficult when they're in a complex society because there's a lot of things going on, a lot of different motions and actions. And so being able to function in a society when you can only see one thing at one given time makes it extremely difficult. The second thing is optic ataxia. Optic ataxia is then when you have the visual cues. So instead of not being able to see things, you're actually able to see which one's in front of the other, which one's closer to you, farther away, and what both of them typically are. Sometimes they won't be able to identify them when they're apart from each other, but they are able to identify them when they overlap. However, when you ask someone with um, optic ataxia to reach out for that item, there's a disconnect. So the person isn't able to connect those visual cues to um, their motor reflexes. So once you have someone that's reaching out, you say, hey, can you grab this phone? They'll more likely miss and be reaching for it, but not make any connection. As you can see so far, with these two things going together, you're getting a really big inability to do two major functions. Recognize objects and grasp those objects. So if you can envision so far being someone that has developed Spanlin syndrome, you are not going to be able to basically function in the world as you are today. You won't be able to see where your door is maybe. Um, or maybe you will be able to see the doorknob, let's say, but you won't be able to reach for it.
and you're not certain what that doorknob goes to because you can't see the entire door. So, so far, you're in a really interesting position. You're in a position where the world is different, and it's changed almost instantly. The third subcategory of valence syndrome is ocular apraxia. Basically, ocular apraxia is the inability to do voluntary, voluntary eye movements. So here now we're in a situation where you want to move your eyes. And for most of us, moving our eyes side to side is quite simple. We can look to our left or look to our right, look up and look down, and it's quite simple. But for people that develop Valen sy syndrome, um, this is something that becomes extremely difficult because now they can't move their eyes the way they want to. Typically what happens is that they can move their head, but their eyes stay fixed. And it takes them a long time to get their eyes back to the direction their head is going. So you see a lot of tests done or people showing what ocular apraxia does and they'll be moving the head, but the eyes will stay fixed. So, And it also shows a little bit of a stress because the person's really trying to move those eyes and go with the head action, similar to how we do every day. We turn our head and we look in that direction almost instantly. We don't think about it. We don't think about that being something that is an eye motion with a head reflex. They go together. Um, but with Valen syndrome, it becomes very obvious that those things work at separate times and then are trained over time to work together. Um, what's interesting also about ocular apraxia is that it happens um, in a lot of other disorders too. Um, what I specifically notice is it happens a lot with children and then it kind of, um, for some people, slowly becomes less of an issue. Um, for others, it maintains. Um, but for people that gain Valence Syndrome, mainly because Valence Syndrome tends to um, occur because of tumors, strokes, um, brain injuries, Alzheimer's, those elements that go together with Valence Syndrome normally cause um, people to, to develop this um, at older ages. So relearning these things when you've done them all your life um, makes it extremely hard to function. Um, there's a few different people which was reading on um, and one lady that stuck out to me um, just woke up and realized that the world just seemed really strange to her. She couldn't see the doors. She could recognize some of the doorknobs but she couldn't reach them. She couldn't like move her eyes swift enough to realize what was going on and in a completely different world. She tried to sleep it off, um, but she was, she was having a stroke. And um, she didn't recognize it at first, but now she has Valence Syndrome and she has changed her world. So um, one thing that I found fascinating in her story was that her son helped her develop a way to better recognize her home. Because one of the things that bothered her the most about the syndrome is that now her house, her home that she's lived in for so many years, was unrecognizable. And so they found out that yellow was a color that stood out to her, was something that helped her kind of map out the world. And what they did is they added yellow tape to all the doors, to um, the frames of the doors, Everything that was very important to her, she needed to know so she could map out the house, they lined with yellow tape. So then, what she could see were these, like, yellow frames or these balls of something. And so she knew, oh, I'm in this room because it's here, and I've been told it's here, because she needed assistance. Um, and then she could basically remap her house into a new way of, of seeing and thinking. So... Basically, that's Valen syndrome. Um, it's just these subcategories coming together and creating this one syndrome um, where your brain, your visual cues, 
and your movements are no longer synced in together. Um, I hope I hope that helped. It made sense. Uh, and if it didn't, ask me questions, and I would love to answer them because I want you to succeed. <laughs> So yeah, that's Bainless Syndrome, um, and there you go. So, have a good day. I am in groups for chapters three and four. I am in groups. What the, what am I saying? <laughs>